to you, so yes. Okay. Are we all ready? I think we are. Hi. Well, Hi. Hi. Welcome back to the Barocci Group. I hope you all had a really pleasant summer. We had a wonderful time coming up with a few topics for this coming season. So we'll just quickly go through these before we get on to today's subject. So today, cheek to cheek, Salome dancing before Herod by Moreau. On the 21st of October, we have our Paris trip to Bishop Auckland. Woo! <laughs> if any of you are interested and want to attend, please email me Mrs. Rose Herslop at gmail.com by the 15th of October. I'm hoping to send an itinerary and instruction some point tomorrow, some point Tuesday, depending on life and misadventures and what have you. Um, the following day on Sunday, October the 22nd, Irene and I are also going to put together a presentation on the Spanish Golden Age. Eh? God help us. God help us. God always helps us, Irene. Come on. Always. always. Spanish Golden Age in painting and decorative art. So because of the nature of the Spanish galleries, we can't really do a guided tour. So we thought we'd just be on stand in the by on the Saturday and then put something informative together for your delights on mm -hmm. Sunday. Um, and then on the November 19th, seeing within Caspar David Friedrich, hosted by our lovely and beautiful Irene. And then, to, Irene. and then to finish off, Sunday, December the 17th, we will be looking at the light of the world, Rococo interiors. And some of you may be thinking, well, that's not really Catholic. It looks at the cultural narrative of the candle and how it was appropriated by the nobility in, by the French in the 18th century from the clergy and it's looking at how ecclesiastical architecture and theories of light influenced a secular worldly interior. So we're going to try to focus on architecture and the decorative arts more so um, and if any of you have any suggestions for lecture topics please get in touch, email us, talk to us, grab us in the corner after mass um, pass on a message via Father Daniel. If you have ideas, if there's something you want us to cover, let us know. We'll be more than happy to give it to go. So, shall we say a little prayer before we get started? Right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 O Saint Lucy, you prefer to let your eyes be torn out instead of denying the faith and defiling your soul. And God, through an extraordinary miracle, replace them with another pair of sound and perfect eyes to reward your virtue and faith, appointing you as the protector against eye diseases. I come to you to protect my eyesight and to heal, and to heal the illnesses in my eyes. And please guard me as I look upon art this afternoon. O oh, Saint Lucy, Preserve the light of my eyes, so that I may see the beauties of creation, the glow of the sun, the colour of the flowers, and the smile of children. Preserve also the eyes of my soul, the faith through which I can know my God, understand his teachings, recognise his love for me, and never miss the road that leads me to where you, St. Lucy, can be found in the company of the angels and saints. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Right, let's get this cracking. Right, cheek to cheek, Salome dancing for Herod by Gustav Moreau. Tawdry Jezebel, or feminist martyr. The cultural position which the figure of Salome holds in modern times is often one of paradox. Such contradictions can be traced directly back to a single work of art. Salome, Dancing Before Herod by Gustave Moreau, originated the modern archetype of the femme fatale, and by consequence, symbolism as an artistic movement. Though well received at the Salon of 1876, when it was first exhibited by Moreau to the French public, Salome, Dancing Before
before Herod inspired many an author and artist to run away with an exotic fantasy of this biblical figure. From the protagonist enraptured with the unnatural, decorated facets of Salome costume in J.K. Weissman's Arabor, or to Oscar Wilde using Salome as a metaphor for forbidden love in his eponymous play. But Moreau's approach to art is not so straightforward. Contemporary academic literature continues to overlook the Catholic mysteries imbued within Moreau's work, arguing that Moreau's depiction of the dance affirms its origins in ritualistic seduction as a challenge to the prurient standards set by the Academy de Beaux-Arts, which presented the female body as a static object of myth and titillation and magic. Rather than seeing her frantically dancing circles around men's hearts a la Rita Hayworth, the art historian Peter Cook maintains that Moreau's Salome symbolises the bewitching femininity of ancient times. This presentation is indebted to Peter Cook's scholarship, but would like to take analysis to a more personal level by reuniting Salome with her biblical, Christic and human origins. If the Dance of the Seven Veils has lost its charm on you, and you desire a more Catholic understanding of this biblical figure, then look no further. This afternoon we will strip away, layer by layer, the symbolism behind Moreau's infamous painting. Mm. So, before we get started on the painting, can you see all right, Father? Grand. Let's have a look at the life of the elusive Gustave Moreau. So, Moreau was born on the 6th of April, 1826, and he died on the 18th of April, 1898. So, just to contextualise that for everybody, he was born around the same decade as Gustave Courbet and Jérôme, and um, he was a little older by uh, about 10 to 15 years. Um, he was older than Degas and um, Claude Monet. Monet was born in 1840. So Moreau was a little bit too early to be classed as an Impressionist. Um, he drew incessantly from about age eight. His father was very, very supportive of his painting and his desires to become an artist. But being a good dad, he insisted that younger staff had his classical education. He was taught French, Latin, Greek, he was incredibly well read. He played the piano beautifully. Uh, anecdotally, he was a superb cantor as well. So really an accomplished man. Um, in 1846, Moreau earned a place at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. So if you're not too familiar with French art history, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts is just like the Royal Academy in London today. You have a state-sanctioned or government-sanctioned um, school that teaches students um, the absolute epitome and important um, techniques of painting, drawing, sculpture. It was the place to go if you were an aspiring young man who wanted to become an artist. Um, Moreau studied under Francois Edouard Picot as well. Just remember that name because it's going to come up a couple of times later in this presentation. Um, he left the Ecole prematurely in 1849 because he didn't win the Grand Prix de Rome, which was essentially the French version of the Grand Tour. Um, so he made copies of art in the Louvre. He often copied from the classical statue, paintings, whatever he could lay his eyes on. And um, he was well acquainted with Eugene Delacroix as well. In 1864, he exhibited, no, in 1853, his family bought a townhouse and converted the loft into a studio for him. In 1864, he exhibited Oedipus and the Sphinx. He won a medal which cemented his reputation as a serious artist. Um, his professional aim as an artist was to reinvent the history painting, quote-unquote. Um, his style drew quite a lot of criticism, however. And from 1869, he did not exhibit another painting at the Salon until 1876, when he exhibited Salome dancing before Herod. Um, he became a bit of a recluse. He permanently withdrew from exhibiting at the Salon in 1880, and he rejected many accolades and prestigious teaching positions. 
It was only after the death of his friend Ailey Delaunay in 1891 that he decided to take over the studio of his friend at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. Um, and he excelled as a teacher, counting Henry Matisse and Georges Rouault and other notable artists amongst his people. So he has a legacy as well. He's just been unfortunately sidelined in the history of art. But that's starting to change. So are we familiar with the story of Salome? Shall we just have a quick look at what is said in the Gospel? Um, Johnny, would you like to read? Okay. Go on. Yes. <laughs> at the time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works shew forth, themse shew forth themselves in him. For Herod had apprehended John and bound him, and put him into prison because of Herodias, his brother's wife. For John said to him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. And having a mind to put him to death, he feared the people because they esteemed him as a prophet. But on Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod, whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask of him. But she, being instructed before by her mother, said, Give me here in a dish the head of John the Baptist. And the king was struck sad. Yet, because of his oath, and for them that sat with him at table, he commanded it to be given. And he sent, and beheaded John in the prison. And his head was brought in a dish, and it was given to the damsel. And she brought it to her mother. Thank you, Johnny. So it's important to note that this episode happens twice in the Bible, in the Gospel of Matthew and in the Gospel of Mark. I've just given Father Daniel a hand out and hopefully it will slowly make its way around this afternoon so that you can have a look at the painting. It's really difficult to put on full screen without losing all the detail because Moreau loves a bit of detail and ornamentation, which we'll find out soon enough. So, here's the painting, and have a look and have a think, and just pay attention to the first thoughts that come up in your mind. What, what does it conjure? <coughs> I'm wondering how big it is in your life. Oh, I'd say it's from the bottom of the crucifix down to about here. So, reasonable. Reasonable. Okay. It's like they're in a church. Well, yes, exactly, exactly. So, there's another enlarged image as well of the figures. And just sort of take it in. And there's Herodias, there's Salome, Herod and the Executioner. It's a lot of sort of Orientalism. Mm. Exotic. Mm. Garments and jewelry and things. Yeah. So I'll show you the first words that cropped up into my mind when I saw this painting. So I thought it was quite atmospheric, detailed, luscious, sinister, exotic, voyeuristic, chilling, mysterious, and ecclesiastical as well. So Morrow intended this to be a history painting, and for those of you who aren't too familiar with the hierarchy of genres in French art, a history painting is a work with a subject matter that's drawn from classical history, mythology, and the Bible. So um, I would say that's very much in line with a history painting. You've got a scene from the Gospel. Um, Salome um, preoccupied Morrow's imagination for most of his artistic life. So, um, we have a whole range of different Salome's. We have Salome standing up in front of us. We have her Salome's back towards us with this um, beheading of um, St. John the Baptist in the right-hand corner. We have another scene of Salome in the prison listening to the execution. And then there's the apparition of St. John the Baptist's head, Salome dancing for Herod. A tattooed Salome as well. 
Um, so yes, it was highly significant to his artistic output. Morrow approached the biblical theme of Salome dancing for Herod in 19, painting, 19 paintings, six watercolours and more than 150 drawings. And Salome dancing for Herod forms part of a series of at least eight closely resembling paintings and more than 40 ske um, sketch drawings and is regarded as a key work of Morrow's opus symbolism and fantasy art in general. One reason why they form such a huge part of his work is largely due to his theory of modes, a little bit like series painting, and it, it came from his study of Nicolas Poussin in particular, and he's convinced Moreau that different feelings and ideas are modified by the use of a different style in a different mode, addressing specific compartments of the mind, the soul and the heart. So there are many ways of looking at this scene. There are many ways of interpreting Salome. There are many ways of depicting the execution of St. John the Baptist and portraying those relations. And Mora was fascinated by this. Um, he defined it in his inaugural speech at the Academy de Beaux-Arts in November 1890 as this tonality this intellectual diapason, which makes one choose and adapt the means of colour, form, character and style to the subjects that one is treating. So he wasn't just slapped down, she didn't just think, oh, right, we'll paint Salome, we'll put her in a nice little costume, we'll let her dancing, right, done, let's do something else. No, he was very careful, very thoughtful about people. So let's just have a quick look at the details of uh, Morrow's painting. I mean, ideally I'd have the painting here and you'll be coming up and looking, but we can't quite afford that luxury. So, where is it? Um, it is in the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, which is part of the UCLA campus. So, yeah, I, I don't quite have the means, but I wish I did. <laughs> um, so in the top right hand corner, we have a close up of Salome's costume jewellery and it's sort of cold, it's metallic, and that's contrasted against the red velvet of her robe and the softness of her white skin. And note that there's a statue of the evangelists right behind her as well. Bear that in mind as this presentation progresses. In the top left-hand corner, or my left-hand corner, oops, um, you've got tiles on arches, you've got the light and the dark of the um, sunlight beaming in, so you've got contrasts of hot and cold. Here on the floor you have individual flowers, the petals are painted, you have the fur of the panther versus the marble behind the panther. And then finally in this corner we have the silkiness of Herod's robes and that's juxtaposed with the sharpness of the blade of the executioner and also the paint flaking off of the column. Why have we gone into so much detail? Morrow is adept at painting texture, demonstrating his mastery of oil painting. He really knows how to evoke mood, how to capture detail. And it's easy to see, based on this, why Morrow's painting has perpetuated this salacious, witchy reputation that Salome is associated with today. Um, it was a notorious painting, cementing Morrow's reputation as the grandfather of symbolism. But what is symbolism and how can we define it? How can this artistic movement be born from a work which was simply intended to narrate a biblical narrative? We're going to have a very quick history lesson within an art history lesson. So, 19th century history painting. Have we all been to the Musée d'Orsay? Have some of you been to the Musée d'Orsay? Long time ago, yeah. Um, for those of you who have, walking around, you've got Impressionists and, um, you know, Monet, Manet, Degas on one side, and then you have these big, grand paintings of serious historical relevance and importance. And um, as we just find them, they're paintings with subject matter drawn from classical history, mythology, and the Bible. And the 19th century is a very specific breed of history painting. So, um, in order to paint, a work that would be accepted and loved by the Salon, which was 19th century France's equivalent to the summer exhibition at the Royal Academy, um, your history painting had to capture a single episode. It had to have unified action and composition. It needed to have a clear message. 
it needed a photographic quality and the bodies of your subjects had to be idealised. So, to kick things off, I've chosen the parody Perdue, painted in 1867 by Alexandre Cabanel. Now, Cabanel studied under Francois Picot with Gustave Moreau. Cabanel is the perfect example to juxtapose Moreau's art against. So let's have a look at what's going on. You've got, let's see if the mouse will work. Ha ha! Right, here we go. Technology's working. Here is God. He is pointing out to Adam and Eve. Eve, flailing, overcoming sadness has to be expelled from the garden. She's committed to the most terrible sin. She's disobeyed God. Adam's grumpy shadow on his face. Oh, doesn't want God to see him. Knows he's naked. And then underneath, where's, where's the mouse? We have the serpent. And we have Satan writhing around in the corner as well. And, um, there are some aesthetic similarities between the way Cabanel has depicted God and the creation of Adam in the Sistine Chapel. So Cabanel has drawn upon his education in Rome, looking at Michelangelo's um, Sistine Chapel ceiling. Everything is there, everything goes together. Bish, bash, bosh, gets a medal. Wonderful. Um, where's my mouse? <laughs> Bear with me. Right, here we go. Um... Allegory wasn't a priority at this point in history. And just to refresh our memories, allegory is a visual or literary representation in which a character, place or event can be interpreted to represent a hidden meaning with moral or political significance. Though allegory was essential for history painting, you needed to slip it in somewhere, this device was expected to play a supporting role rather than be the main feature. It was secondary to the ideal of depicting a dominant thought formed with clarity. Okay, so some allegory is present within this painting, and um, sort of going with the more Jewish interpretation, which most viewers at the Salon would know. So Adam is conceived as pure intellect, that's why he's clutching his head. Eve is just a body flailing in misery, can't see her face, can only see her body. And then the serpent is fantasy that tries to trap intellect through the body. And that's emphasised by depicting Satan as a little fawn as well. Fawns were really all the rage in 19th century history painting as well. They actually got their own genre called the fantasy painting. Uh, this type of painting merits a presentation in its own right because it's completely bonkers, as you will soon see. Um, so we do need to delve into some prurient imagery before we get on to, um, not Kavanaugh, before we get on to Morrow's painting as well. Um, so just bear with me. There is a reason why there is a lot of seemingly gratuitous nudity. So this was also painted by Cabanel in 1863. It's the birth of Venus, and it was exhibited at the Salon of 1863 as well. And um, I mean, it doesn't really need much explanation, does it? The composition embodies ideals of academic art. You've got your mythological subject, graceful modelling, silky brushwork, and a perfected female form. And this is the mythologising of the female nude. It's unreal, therefore it's socially acceptable, which is highly problematic and hypocritical, as you will see in the next painting. So... I have a question. Why, yeah. why are the women always in this uh, flailing pose? Like, why, why is it always the same pose for the women? Well, this is, this is what we're getting on to, my dear. What's the coast guard? What, what is the coast guard? Where is the coast guard? <laughs> So this is um, a painting by Jean-Léon Jérôme. He was a contemporary of Moreau's and Cabanel's as well. And this is Fryn, revealed before the Areopagus. So just to nutshell the um, narrative for you, Fryn was a very famous courtesan in ancient Greece, and um, she was put on trial for profaning the Elysian Eleusinian mysteries and basically committing great blasphemy against the Greek gods. So 
one of her lovers, Hyperides, who's the bloke in blue, um, was defending her at this trial, and it appeared the verdict would be unfavourable, so he whipped her clothes off. <laughs> As you do! The sight of her nude body apparently so moved the judges <laughs> that they acquitted her. <laughs> her body, her body is good, true, and beautiful. Overcoming the pagan culture, this is what people actually thought. Jerome caused quite the stir, however, with this painting because he painted Frin in full blown nudity. Because in the literature, it's only her breasts that are revealed to the judges. Oh, um, but this painting in general, I mean, look at their faces. You know, he's, have, he's dumbfounded. He's having the time of his life. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like he's going to be sick. <laughs> and um, that one's left the other one. <laughs> reflects the 19th century, 19th century French men's attitudes towards women's bodies and how the sin of lust had snuck into the art world. Um, so you know what the tableau vivant is? You aware of the living, the living painting? When people pose for a long period of time pretending to be a classical work of art that we all recognise. This is the, yeah. Um, <laughs> these were really popular in the 19th century and a particular um, tableau vivant that was well loved was um, the living statue in the 19th century you'd have many naked women painted in black and white standing as frin in public at places like the salon and it was considered very good and proper but they weren't allowed to move because if you moved it would become pornographic yeah mm. I'm not sure if I agree with them. But anyway, Moreau despised the theatricality of 19th century academic painting. I need a quick cheeky drink. Mm. The theatre and drama in the plastic or pictorial arts. An idiotic and childish mixture. Theatricality signified the annihilation of pictorial form. And the academy was responsible for the complete negation of the only qualities that are worthy of admiration in an artist. Imagination, caprice, and feeling. These are things Moro actually wrote. Um, this painting really got on his nerves. So this is The Dance of the Alma, painted two years later by Jerome in 1863. And, uh, well, it's ridiculous again. It caused a stir because it was considered very saucy. Um, who'd have thunk it? And then Morrow wrote, so enraged, and what these so-called conscientious people do? A journey that allows them to see and note with more or less material exactitude a scene, a costume, a foreign exotic figure. In figure painting, people have come to understand only ethnographic painting, aka Orientalism. They represent a woman drawn in France after a French woman covered in flashy rags brought back from the Orient, and they call that the belly dance. No truly original physiognomy, false types, complete absence of life, etc. And they do not stop to think that the Flemish, who were condemned by nature to a humble and familiar spirit, lived all their lives in the midst of their models, which they still managed in their great experience and their great feeling for art to find a way to transform. It, Transform. It would appear that wokeism and cultural appropriation were already an issue in 19th century France, as much as we like to think that we're modern and with it today. And then the, the final work in this sort of history of history of arts. So in 1870, about six weeks before the Franco-Prussian War broke out, there was the final salon that was um, headed by Napoleon, Louis Napoleon, the Emperor of France. And Henri Regnault submitted his Salome. And um, like all of it, it's an oil on canvas. So let's, let's have a look at her, okay. So her hair is ruffled. Her clothes are dishevelled. She's obviously just performed this uh, little number before Herod. She's holding a platter, as you can see. She's got a cocky smile and she's looking directly at the viewer with her hand on hip, waiting for her reward. 
and the foot that is halfway in her slipper. And this is always true in every painting that you come across prior to the 20th century. Her foot halfway in the slipper signifies sex, every single time. Um, so Regno initially wanted to paint an African woman. He then enlarged his canvas and he turned it into Salome instead. And just, well, he just went all out and painted as much exoticism as he could get away with. As, you know, that, that's the thing. So how does Morrow's depiction of Salome differ to what we have just encountered? So similarities. She has this pale alabaster skin going for her. Her face is obscured. She has this ageless beauty. But the differences, she's fully clothed. You know, the family we just saw, she was sort of dishevelled and things were falling off of her. In this one, she is ornate. Everything is pristine, fixed, knows its place. Her eyes are shut. Now, the women we just saw, difficult to see on this television screen, their eyes are all open. They're sort of half blind, pretending not to look at you, but all of their eyes are open, which shows that they're a part of the narrative. There, there is some awareness of the environs around them. And um, finally, she's performing. The others are sort of flailing around or being used as part of the narrative. She's dancing. This is highly significant. This suggests there is a level of self-consciousness and command within this work that the other women that we have looked at don't quite possess. So Moreau famously said of his Salome when critics were asking him during the salon what he thought and what he was intending, he said, it isn't a dance. So a quick show of hands, how many of you think she's dancing? Yeah, John? It is. Yeah. I'm distracted by the flower. Is yeah. it really that she's holding it? Yeah, 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 exactly. She's on point. Yeah. Sorry, you've, you've seen the presentation. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Need the thought. <laughs> okay, so. Both Morrow's. Yeah, thanks. Okay, right. So, she's standing on point. Okay, so I've put a painting of Degas' ballerinas next to Salome just to emphasise this and to look at how dance is captured by a contemporary artist in 19th century. Moreau and Degas actually met and they disagreed with each other um, quite intensely. Um, but I think they remained semi in contact. Um, but Moreau knew what Degas was up to. He wanted to paint Salome on point. Um, so, <laughs> so um, we know Degas' ballerines are dancing and that's really shown by the curve of their arms and the shadows emphasising the contortions in their body. Um, the art historian Richard Thompson says about Degas, observation and medium are always put to the service of form in movement. In other words, Degas used complementary colours in his chalk paintings to capture the movement of his dancers through light and shadow, texture, posture, etc. If you imagine blue and orange next to each other and how they bounce and jump, and that, that's what Degas was doing. He was having a whole experiment, experiment, experimentation with light and colour through complementarities. Um, Moreau, mm, well, it was a more fleshed out study of the human body, as it were. Women are far more active in Degas paintings, and thus their bodies are normalised and they're natural, hence the term naturalism. Degas famously sat in the wings and in training sessions, watching the ballerinas, getting to know them, and these were young girls. Let's not forget, they're about 12 to 14 years old, much like Salome was when she was dancing before Herod, I presume. For Morrow, however, observation and medium are always put to the service of poetic ideals and form in stasis. 
So both are making similar gestures. However, Salome is much more static than the ballet dancer. Um, Moreau famously described his Salome as such. He said, I wish to render the figure of a sibyl or prophetess or a religious enchantress with a mysterious character. And so I conceive the costume, which is like a reliquary. And he does give primacy of costume over primacy of movement. And it's not like Moro didn't know how to paint. Here are some preparatory sketches, just to show you what he was capable of. Um, you have these various figures, all meant to be Salome, and the staticness of their arms contrasts with the sort of rough, flowing textures, um, fabric rather, behind the um, figures. And that shows dancing. It's a wonderful way of showing movement. The, um, the fabric behind Salome, it's, it, it's kind of moving, but it also looks really starchy and very, very stiff. So, hmm, what's going on? Why, what, what is happening? Why is it such a clean, clear and crisp outline that we have? Why is there not one item of clothing out of place if you imagine Renaud Salome with her everything falling out? So, why is she so still? Well, we need to look at Morrow's education and delve a little deeper to find out. So, if we consider the earlier paintings we saw, we have classic works of impassive and mobile beauty. We have seen how such ideas had almost superseded narrative in previous history paintings, reducing the status of quasi-mythological figures like Fryn, um, Venus as a mythological figure, um, Salome, etc., to a pretext for depicting an idealised nude. The classical references that we can see here, and these are sketches for our Salome, are a direct result of Moro's academic training. Um, there's a lot of... Um, pardon me. Sorry, I had a McDonald's before I came here. <laughs> um, would we agree, looking at her, there's a sense of internal contemplation and stillness? Yeah, she's not really looking out. This internal contemplation stems from aesthetic theories of Johann Joachim Winkelmann, and they were countered a few decades later by Gotthold Ephraim Lessing in the 18th century. It's one of my least favorite debates in art history, but it's, we need to cover it briefly. So Winkelmann famously described classical sculpture of a noble simplicity and quiet grandeur, both in whiteness and in expression. And it's from Winkelmann, the ideals of the Salon took form in 18th century France. They discovered the Herculaneum, everyone got excited, and that's how neoclassicism began as an artistic movement in the mid-18th century. The stillness of the body encourages the viewer to pause and to contemplate what they see. Rather than a snapshot of the biblical episode, which we saw with the um, fall of Adam and Eve, Salome is almost estranged from the sea, from the scene, estranged from the scene by merit of her own stasis, her static posture. Lessing, however, countered Winkelmann in his Lacroix, an essay on the limits of painting and poetry. And Lessing argues um, against the tendency to take the phrase ut pictura poesis as painting, so poetry, as prescriptive for the arts. So just to make that a bit more condensable and easier on a Sunday afternoon, Lessing argued that you cannot write poetry in the same way as you would paint a sculpture, you just can't. Right, if you read a poem, I'm sure most of you have read a poem, it seems to be suspended in time, you're sort of lost in the text. If you're looking at a painting, it is suspended in space, that's essentially what Lessing uh, was getting at and he thought that Winkelmann was wrong. Um, but, you know, being Moro, both Winkelmann's aesthetic ideals and Lessing's pragmatic understanding of art and literature underpin Moro's approach to painting, which is one of the many reasons why his art is so difficult to read. And he jolly well knew this as well. He didn't want you to have an easy time looking at his paintings. He wanted you to approach the myth 
to fill it in with your imagination and to think about what you're looking at, not to be told. Um, Morris sets himself the task of reconciling immobile, anti-theatrical and classical beauty with narrative and history painting, forging a paradoxical aesthetic that both fascinated and bemused his contemporaries. He modelled Salome on a very famous French painting that does seem to straddle the tension between literature and the visual arts. So, by looking at Salome, did any of you have this painting spring to mind? Brother David. <laughs> All right, so this is the Oath of the Horatii. It was painted between 1784 and 1785 by Jacques Louis David. And this is really the beginning of neoclassicism in painting in France. Um, so Moro regularly modelled his subjects on well-known poses from art history, either from work of contemporaries or from biblical scenes. David, our man here, trained Pico and Ang, and Pico, yeah, there's a lineage, Pico trained Moro. Moro copied works of art in the Louvre which he then trained his students to do later on in his career. So, yeah, I'm pretty confident that Morrow would be highly familiar with this very famous work of art. So, just to give you a bit of context as to what's actually going on in this painting, I didn't know until I had to do this presentation either. Um, so, it's based on written legend, and the composition itself is based on a classical relief sculpture. So, the three Horatii brothers of Rome, there, swear an oath before their father carrying the swords, and they vow to fight to the death against their three cousins, the Curaceae of Alba Longa, in order to settle a dispute between the two cities with minimum bloodshed. And their tense stances contrast with the rather fluid and woeful contours of the women slumped in the corner to the right. And there's sort of been grief and resignation that their husbands have to go off to war. Um, the men are displaying restrained emotion, correct social order. They represent sacrifice of the individual for the good of the state. Highly masculine ideals. If you remember the aesthetic of the 18th century before this, you had the Rococo with all of its flats and frivolities and inverted commas. Though this work was painted for Louis XVI, it represents anti-monarchy and an anti-Catholic revolutionary France. Look carefully, there's no reference of church there at all. And it's really the f one of the first examples of a secular state painting in French art history, which is why it's so shocking. Um, now, let's have a look at Salome. She's gesturing towards the executioner's sword, but she isn't touching it. Looks like they're almost touching the swords. Here, there's a bit of a gap. She's gesturing. Instead, she's clasping a lotus flower, which is a symbol of sensuality, exoticism, and desire. But the white, as we know, also represents virginity. So I want to ask you, and I want you to think, is the lotus flower Salome's weapon? Just percolate, let it rest. As established, Salome's eyes are shut. You'd think she'd be asking for the sword if you only looked at her hand and the sword. You'd expect her face to be looking up, about to ask, please, can I have this? But her gaze is turned inwards and it is obstructed by the flower as well. Now, where are the women? So we have women there. Where are the women in Moreau's painting? Well, they're behind Salome here. Do you, is that clear enough, do you see? Yeah? Um, and in contrast, their eyes are wide open. Herodias is gazing towards Salome, creating another compositional line. She is an active figure in this painting, not Salome. Remember in both Gospels, it's Herodias who tells Salome to dance before her stepfather and half uncle. So just very quickly in bold. Reading this text, we can agree that the climax of the narrative is not Salome dancing before Herod, but the persecution, but the presentation rather, of the head of John the Baptist 
to Herodias. The gospel is structured much like a Greek tragedy, whereby the grisly act takes place off stage in order to maintain unity of space. The goal of a painting as events take place in a single space. Moro knows what he's doing. Moreover, the gospel never tells us of Salome's will or intentions. It's up to us through guidance of the Holy Spirit to discern what she's thinking and feeling. Moro was fascinated by this ambiguity and has very much incorporated this dichotomy within his painting. The material fact versus the spiritual truths. And also note that Salome is anonymous. She's not named in this text and she's not named in the Gospel of Mark. Who names Salome? Talking heads. <laughs> Herodotus? No. Uh, uh, Josephus? Yes. That's what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's Josephus. Right. Josephus. Yes. Um, Josephus in Antiquities of the Jews names Salome in 94 AD. And even then, he doesn't mention the dance, he just says, oh, this is the daughter of Herodias. Mm. So, you know, not quite so clear cut, clean cut as we'd like. Salome then seems to play an anonymous bit part in the gospel, but has taken centre stage in the narrative of painting and sculpture in Western art history. So, there's not just Regnaud who painted Salome. When I say Salome, I'm pretty sure most of you can see a Caravagesque, black and white, Baroque painting of a woman carrying a platter, looking slightly sick and disgusted with herself, and an executioner leering over. Or maybe Lucas Cranach with the blonde, smiley, self-satisfied Salome, like, oh! Um, Titian as well. Titian starts to play with the exoticism. There's a very famous painting with um, the pattern and John the Baptist's head and um, Salome's holding it over her and the hair is caressing her forehead and it's all a little bit eerie and macabre. And these were usually served as a warning to men about the destructive force of female beauty. But this still placed limelight on the daughter. Strange. So let's just read between the lines with this gospel. Let's pretend we're Herodias, put ourselves in the shoes of Herodias. I don't like this John the Baptist fellow. He was rude about my second marriage to my ex-husband's half-brother. I have a daughter, and she's probably still a virgin, and my husband likes to make big sweeping statements when he's excited. I will ask my daughter to dance before her stepfather when my husband makes one of these great promises, and she is unsure of what to ask for. I will tell her to demand the head of John the Baptist on a platter and he won't be able to back out of it. So who's sinning? Where is the sin? What is the sin? Are we inclined to think that it's Herodias who is the active sinner? Is Salome complicit as well? Well, what's going on? I'd like to establish it. Ooh, how dare you? I'd like to establish at this point that Mora uses the material fact of Salome's femininity and beauty to make her a symbol of temptation. And she's therefore <laughs> abstracted within the painting's narrative. All eyes are on her, but she's shying away from our expectations, our gazes, our preconceptions. You know, it's like when you see someone across the room, you think they're looking at you, you look at them, and then they're, ooh. And that, that weird sort of eerie juxtaposition you get when you think you've caught someone's eye and she doesn't give it back to you. He knows what he's doing. The text in both Gospels is highly laconic as well, thus it's difficult to discern Salome's true will. Is she truly an evil temptress that we see her for in today's secular world, or just an unwitting instrument in her mother's hands? Remember, it's the father passing on the swords to his sons, just as it's the mother who has put Salome up to the task of dancing, weaponizing her beauty and ignorance. This is emphasized by the contrast between Herodias' gaze and Salome's closed eyes as well. And we must remember that Salome's seductive dancing, inherent beauty and feminine allure are not the paroxysm or the climax of this episode in the Gospels. It's the beheading of St. John the Baptist that is the climax. 
Morrow was infamous for doing this. In reinventing the history painting, he often avoided capturing the climatic, dramatic, episodic moment that we have seen earlier in other history paintings. In the mythological and biblical paintings he created, Morrow favoured the moments leading up towards the high drama instead, rather than the main action in it itself, making the paintings that he created really ambiguous. You're seeing events that are about to unfold, not the tragedy in itself. So we've looked at the action of the painting, we've pulled it to pieces. Let's try to quickly look at the setting of the painting as well, because my goodness, the architecture in this, wow. There you go. Um, so we have examples of Egyptian architecture, Indian architecture, Roman, Etruscan, Persian, Chinese, Moorish, Turkish, you name it, it's in this painting. Moro rarely ventured out of France. He has about two documented trips to Italy in his lifetime, and he often um, relied upon publications such as The Grammar of Ornament by the British architect and designer Owen Jones, <clears throat> in addition to the paintings he's seen by his contemporaries. There's um, a suggestion of the harem as well in this painting as well. I don't know if any of you sort of saw it and thought A Thousand and One Nights. Yeah? It's got a bit of a One Thousand and One Nights vibe to it. Um, really, the harem in the Islamic culture is a women-only domestic space, and it's Delacroix who turned it into this sort of exotic den of sin and fantasy as we know it today in the West. And Delacroix had an influence on um, Morrow's artistic output. Not too much, but you know, they, they knew each other. He pushed Morrow to look beyond the classical ideals that he'd been trained by. And then finally, I don't know if any of you sort of thought that the space in the foreground is a little bit of a theatrical space. You know, you've got, uh, let's see if I can pull it back. You've got Herodias, and the musicians standing next to Salome in the wings. You've got the flowers strewn across the floor. You've got many steps up to the action itself. Morrow was against theatricality and over dramatisation, but he included the theatrical in his painting. And what does this make us as the viewer? That's really what he's getting at. Are we also party goers in Herod's Sin Palace? Is he hinting? at the emergence of voyeurism in 19th century France. It probably is. Um, so let's think about ways we could depict sin in the 19th century salon, which mm, many had many um, moral um, standards controlling it. Um, <clears throat> ornamentation in art so my, my specialism is ornament, 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 love it. Um, in the 20th century, 21st century, we've forgotten really what it's for. Um, ornamentation serves to direct the gaze and thoughts of the viewer at what is, whatever it is they're looking at. Um, so you've got this luscious decadence which is covering the walls of Herod's palace and it could really act as an allegory for the sinful behaviour at Herod's party. So rather than painting orgies and alcohol and goodness knows what else was happening at that party. Morrow goes for ornament. It's a little bit more tactful. You can have that aestheticisation of excess without upsetting people. Very canny thing to do. Um, a very wise man once told me that it's always wicked people who celebrate their birthdays in the Bible. And St Ambrose made it very clear <laughs> But um, every type of sin imaginable was taking place at the party. And yes, we have Diana of Ephesus here, the many-breasted fertility goddess. And she's flanked by two statues of Anraman, who is the Iranian god of pure evil. Mm. And they're sitting above Herod, who resembles a corpse sitting upon a throne. Now, many art historians have made ties to this painting. It was um, Herod's pose in um, Morrow's work 
is highly similar to that of um, Pope Formosus and Stephen VI, painted in 1870 by Jean-Paul Lorraine, which portrays the Cadaver Synod, which actually happened in history. Um, it took place at the start of 897 AD. I'm not going to go into it. It's absolute madness. We'll do it another another lecture. Um, but notes. Stephen VI's gesture is highly similar to Salome's, and um, Herod resembles the deceased Pope Formosus. If you have a look at his face, you know, he's all white, he's all pale, he's sickly looking around the face. If ornament is used as a visual allegory for sin and excess in Morrow's painting, then this depiction of Herod supports this reading. He's lost behind ornamentation and architecture just as we'd be lost if we don't have the sacrament of reconciliation. The more we sin, the more dead we become inside. That's why confession is such a beautiful thing. Um, this contributes to the rather gloomy and morose mood permeating within Morrow's painting. Sin is prevalent within the Herodian line, with Herodias divorcing her first husband, Herod Philip, to marry Herod Antipas, Framing Salome's dance as a result of the sinful activity of her predecessors. And there's further ornamentation of evil as well. So, let's rattle through this. Salome's carrying a lotus flower, so we know that that symbolises lust and sensuality. Um, she's wearing a bracelet there. That is the um, Ujak bracelet of the Egyptians. It has a blue evil eye. Think. Her eyes are closed, she has an open eye on her amulet, her amulet as well. Does that belong to her? Think. There's a black panther beneath her, which for some reason PowerPoint has decided to hide. But there is a black panther, which we have looked at. Um, the musician, there, her breasts are out. She's semi-naked. Herodias is carrying a fan with peacock feathers. Peacocks symbolise lust carnal desires. You've got a sphinx. In ancient Greece, sphinxes devoured the male body and she has been portrayed pretty much wearing an Egyptian headdress as well. So she's surrounded by symbols of lust and evil and again, nothing is really out of place. It all seems so perfectly composed. Based on these facets, the art historian Peter Cook whose writing I have heavily relied on for this presentation, proposes the reading that Moreau is linked to Salome's, Moreau has, is linking Salome's dance back to its origins in pagan ritual. So she's gesturing, she's not dancing. And as we know, Moreau said, I wish to render the figure of a Sibyl or a religious enchantress with a mysterious character. And so I conceive the costume which is like a reliquary. Is Salome a reliquary for the bewitching power of art? Moro reinvented history painting by making the, um, use, making the viewer use their imagination and knowledge in order to bring a work of art to life and filling in the blanks. Time stands still when we are deeply engaged in a beautiful work of art. And remember, we've established that this is a highly self-conscious painting as embodied by Salome and her closed eyes. So Peter Cook maintains that this is not the dance, aka the weaving of slow, sensual steps around men's hearts, but bringing dance back to its pagan origins with hieratic poses, magic and ritual galore. And I, I mean, yeah, I kind of agree with his reading, but I think it only gets us so far in explaining Morrow's proliferation of ornamentation and the strong Catholic overtones that are present within this painting. Oh, thank you, thank you, computer. That's the opposite I wanted you to do. So, ornament. Um, we, have, we have like three or four slides left. We're almost done. Um, ornament gently directs gaze and thought beyond ourselves and out towards the world around us. It invites us to look closely. You know, when you see Father Richard walking up the aisle and he's wearing his vestments and they're just so gorgeous and you want to stare but you can't. <laughs> it reinforces the significance of ritualistic behaviour. Again, Father Richard walking up the aisle. Um, 
It has symbolic and decorative details, and it offers intellectual and aesthetic compensation for the lack of drama within Morrow's paintings. It gives you the moral and intellectual depths, as, we've seen, as we have seen symbolised in her accessories. Um, Morrow is trying to make narrative compatible with contemplative inability, because if you think about it, static still women and tremendous, terrifying, preeminence, preempting execution of St. John the Baptist don't quite fit together, so he has to glue them somehow. Um, they give, they betray Morrow's reverence for early Renaissance art and Orientalism as well. And it's pretty. Why, why can't there be any aesthetic pleasure in art? You know, who said art for art's sake? I, I hate that phrase, it's a terrible phrase. Um, but Morrow's contemporaries didn't really like what Morrow was doing. Um, so one man, Augustin Joseph Dupay, who's used to sort of snapshot um, history painting that we looked at earlier, said, Ornament in Morrow's art is a sterile luxury which amuses the gaze and distracts one's thought from the religious purity of the scene. Devout Catholic as well, Augustin Joseph Dupay. Eugène Bonin says, hardly a moral or religious or philosophical thought in Gustave Moreau's painting of Oedipus and the Sphinx. Moreau did not like this. Moreau took them to town and he said, you do not want to see a lesson in the work of pure art that does not aim at moralising or catechising minds. Well, as for me, I find a very moral effect in the mutilated antique block of stone, think the Pieta representing a sublime fragment of the human body that raises the mind and already draws it nearer to the idea of religion and morality. Moreover, I can tell you that, in matters of art, I have my diplomatic ways. I want, when I am addressing a materialist and anti-spiritualist youth without respect for art or religion, I want, I say, to lead it through the spectacle of the eyes to comprehend the beautiful, which will lead it to comprehend the good. This seems a sufficient lesson to me. These symbols, these accessories, possess an important function. They direct our thoughts and prompt us to ask questions. Who dressed Salome? Was it Salome's mother who dressed her? Did Salome actually pick that outfit out herself? The ornamentation that we see on her body. Is it a comment on our attitudes as the viewer with the 19th century salon goers who preferred episodic and easily digestible paintings? Or is there something more going on? Is Morrow trying to redeem the soul through art history? So let's have another look at this Catholic iconography. Though he rarely practised his faith, Gustav Morrow was certainly inspired by Catholic mysticism, which came to occupy his work towards the end of his life. Morrow was known to use Catholic iconography to inform the placement and poses of his subjects. He would often include this technique within a well-known pagan narrative. This provided a moral undertone to his work, prompting viewers to think very carefully about what it was they were looking at. If the classical pagan narrative was in vogue during the Second Empire of France, Catholic iconography provided a type of commentary on the mores and behaviours that were associated and permitted by it. So very quickly, there are strong visual parallels between his Oedipus and the Sphinx, and um, this depiction of, pardon me, Saint Sebastian, which Morrow probably saw as a print when he was a younger man. Um, at this point in history, France was in danger of forgetting its cultural roots. Iconography and Catholic symbolism were largely being forgotten, ignored, in favour of episodic history painting. This is the country that committed atrocities against the church during the terror of the late 18th century. Churches were ransacked, priests and members of the clergy were hunted down like rats. Thoughtless destruction ripped through the country in the name of revolution. Ornamentation, synonymous with the feminine excess of the Rococo and her hieratic cousin, the Baroque, was to be avoided in favour of the clean, sharp, didactic narrative of classicism. Of course, the propaganda was perpetuated by the Académie des Beaux-Arts 
and the Salon as France struggled to define her cultural identity without king and without church and think. We saw the cadaver synod and the similarities between those paintings. Here's Diana of Ephesius. Does it not look like that she has a halo behind her? Is he asking what are you worshipping? Think. Let it sink in. And we also have the evangelists on Herod's throne as well. And to conclude with two, our final two slides. Morrow describes Salome's costume as a reliquary, not Salome herself. Is it a reliquary of our expectations, or does her static pose conjure ties with Christ's crucifixion on the cross? Reliquaries carry something precious, such as the crown of thorns in Saint-Chapelle or the true cross. Here, Morrow painted the Stations of the Cross earlier on in his career, and has clearly recycled the composition from this over here in his portrayal of Salome. The, her feet are pointed down. They look like they are nailed to the floor, just as Morrow, um, Morrow's Christ's feet are nailed to the cross and Raphael's Christ's feet are nailed to the cross as well. The women at the foot of the cross, similar to the women at the foot of Herod's throne. Salome's purity is sacrificed by her mother. Her actions are triangulated by her mother's gaze and that of Herod's. Though she is meant to be dancing, she is ensnared by expectation, desire, sin. Thus the cruciform that Mora has used for her pose is skewed. Jesus' sacrifice confirmed his purity, whereas Salome's sacrifice condemns her. Moro depicts Salome as a religious temptress. She's not just a belly dancer or a femme fatale or a bewitching priestess, but possessing something of the immortal about her. Herod's throne bears some representation of the high altar as well, and may or may not recall some aspects of the mass for us as viewers as well. I don't know if that penny had dropped for any of you. Salome is also a reliquary of spiritual drama that had been lost in the state narrative he was witnessing in the Academy's art. The propaganda of state-sanctioned art and the decadence associated with it. Moro has been as careful to include the familial degeneracy of Herodias and Herod the Tetrarch, in addition to citing his own art historical lineage by including references to the Oath of the Horatii, painted by David, who was taught by Picot, who taught Moreau and Cabanel. Salome was also described as a Sibyl, which is a type of ancient Greek prophetess. But I don't think that's an entirely fair way to really look at Salome. I don't think that's entirely what Moro was on about. So there is great scope for redemption in Moro's painting. There are parallels between the introspection we can see in the San Zachariah altarpiece by Giovanni Bellini and Herod's throne. The parallel between Our Lady and Salome, both are doing the will of another. The former's virginity is preserved, but the latter's is corrupted by incest, intrigue, and familial chaos. The Holy Family is instituted by Our Lady's yes. A prophet or a saint is beheaded by Salome's. Rather than exacerbate her sex appeal or her culpability, Moreau distills Salome to a point, a mysterious point at that, in the crosshairs of her fallen elders' gazes, just as in the Gospels her dance is but a device, a virtually silent hinge point within the narrative. Morrow is occupying the discomfort of uncertainty and ambiguity. Though perhaps not wholly innocent, Salome's will and thus her personhood are obscured by so many competing interests and lustful intents, emphasised by her ornamentation, that those around her fail to see her humanity. These historical figures, once living and breathing, are further abstracted by time, and we're all guilty of it. How many of us struggle to read the Bible because we find it a bit dry, a bit boring, a bit difficult to relate to? I think we all have, if we're going to be honest with ourselves. We all do this to the people we encounter in the Bible. And perhaps this is a reason why Moreau included universal architecture, because it is the text of all times, the Alpha and the Omega. And to finish, looking at the lotus, this has been painted in a way that is similar to a Marian lily. 
Moro was a scholar in Greek, Roman, Jewish, the esoteric and Eastern philosophies. Thus would have been familiar with the symbolism of the lotus in old Dharmic religions. The lotus has its roots in the dark, dank mud, but opens up on the surface to the light, the fresh air, the sky. Some would call this enlightenment. This is why Buddha sits upon a lotus flower. But to bring this back to a Catholic narrative, Salome is inheriting sin, just as you or I are inheritors of a fallen humanity. The startling beauty of Moro Salome is not to be found in her exotic ornamentation, her ideal skin, her graceful poses, but it's in her ambiguity. Not feminine mystique, which is a cliche, but in her humanity. And is, is this not what we all experience as precious souls made to worship and to love Christ? Each one of us dear to him for reasons we often struggle to fathom. We know our mistakes and our shortcomings, the mud in which we feel plunged and the accusations we find ourselves carrying. Moro has placed the human within the reliquary, that which we cannot judge but only Christ, who has the divine right to do so as our judge. Thank you for your patience this afternoon. Oh, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Johnny? Can you say something more about the um, unnatural pose, which was on point, but it was in an impossible yes. pose? He, he told me he actually yeah. suspended the model yeah. to get that pose. Yeah, so Moro actually built a contraction to dangle his model from. Originally, she was painted on her tippy toes, but she couldn't quite do the point. Um, so Mara built something a bit like a, a bit like a hangman's noose, wrapped her body in it, pulled her up so that she was dangling in his uh, the studio. He was very much committed to the course. Because <laughs> I, I think that was the way you've analysed it. It's almost like she's just ever so slightly elevated. Mm. Out of the mm. line of the scene. Yeah. And I think that's his point, isn't it? It's like, yeah. That's exactly his point. You listen well, my love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Or are you content? All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.